Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood, and balancing life. Every week, we'll share more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of one sentence a day. Life writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. So here we are. And here as a matter are. very exciting, as a matter of fact, I mm -hmm. think, is this episode 14 or 15? I, it's, we've been doing this since, since January. So excited about the way the podcast has been going in terms of our guests, in terms of the responses to the podcast. And we have a very special episode today. Extraordinarily special. One of uh, one of the favorite people that I ever met in my life we're going to be honoring today. So even though she passed away in 2006, in a way, our guest today is the great Octavia E. Butler, because Steve and I interviewed her in the year 2000 for a magazine called American Visions. And we recorded that interview and we are taking excerpts from that interview that are relevant to writers and their process and the writing life. And we are going to let her help you. So she continues to contribute, not just as the artist through her work, but through her wisdom today. Steve, what's that picture? I know on the, on the picture, audio no, you can't hurt, see. Hurt my head right there. When I moved my head, that picture right there is Octavia Butler's house. And that yes. right there was the door to her house. That is where it was on West Boulevard in Los Angeles near Washington, which it, it was about a quarter mile away from my mother's house. So after my mom passed away and I moved back to my mother's house, I was living basically right around the corner from Octavia and we would walk back and forth and visit. Um, I met Octavia in uh, 1978, I believe. Um, and in 1978, it was at the IguanaCon Science Fiction Convention in Phoenix. And Harlan Ellison, who was a friend, uh, introduced me to uh, Samuel R. Delaney, Chip, and to Octavia Butler. Can I just stop you right there? Please. What a heck of a con that was, a convention. We call them cons uh, in, in fandom. Uh, that was a heck of a convention to have Harlan Ellison, Octavia Butler, and Samuel R. Delaney there at the same time. Well, it was a World Science Fiction Convention. Harlan was the guest of honor. Ah, okay, great. Because the, uh, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, was not being ratified by Arizona. He refused to spend any money there, so he almost, they almost bailed on being guest of honor. But he uh, rented a, a huge Winnebago and parked it out in front of the hotel and slept in the Winnebago. He did sneak into the hotel to take showers, though. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know that. That was um, probably best for everyone involved. Best for everyone involved. <laughs> uh, so uh, there may have been a, a female fan or two that maybe that was why he was sneaking out of that room in the morning. But Harlan was quite the rogue, though. That was long before he met his wife, Susan, by the way. Right. Um, but at any rate, I met, I met Octavia. And, uh, you know, I was not real familiar with her work I, i'd read a little bit of her stuff and uh, i thought it was good um she was not just beginning but she'd published several books at that point um but she was not you know the octavia that she became at that point but i'm not even sure kindred had come out yet yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either 1978 i'm not sure at all um and I think Kindred was a little bit later, maybe 79. I could be wrong about that. But but it was, yeah, she was she was not all caps Octavia right, e. Butler yet. Right, not at all. And uh, I became friends with her largely because we were virtually singularities within the science fiction field. After Chip uh, retired from the field uh, to uh, go into academia and, and queer fiction, um, Octavia and I were there alone, so we huddled together to a certain degree and, and, and exchanged and commiserated about what the industry was and, and how the world might, you know, how the world was and how the world might have to change before we were able to accomplish our dreams. Uh, and she was very focused in terms of her dreams. Uh, one of her favorite books about that, do I have that copy? Yeah, absolutely. She loved this book, Think and Grow Rich. Did and she? Yes, she did. And she wrote out 
what she wanted to accomplish and she reread it every day you know by this date i will be a new york times best-selling writer and i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do this and she used that to protect her heart from you know the the lack of success and the lack of respect that the field seemed to give her i mean they would put green people on the covers of her books but they wouldn't put black people on the covers and that, yes. that it hurt her um, but we t we spent many, many hours talking about life and writing and relationships. And uh, it was just, it was, it was really precious to me. I mean, as she became more and more famous, you know, I, I read some of her material, not all of it. Um, and I always knew that she was, she was at a, working at a higher level than I was. Um, and she put everything she had into her writing. You know, she, yes. th there were ways in which she didn't have much life outside her writing. It was almost like a religion to her, it seems. Yeah, writing. I, I agree. And I think that, that, you know, she had her concerns about humanity. Um, and we've talked about that. Perhaps we'll, we'll bring that up here. But um, yeah, I just, I, it was, she was just one of my favorite people. And as she gained more fame, notoriety, very close. And she was discovered by the, by black women and, uh, feminists and she won the macarthur genius grant which once again harlan recommended her for great um, and she was the first science fiction writer to get a macarthur genius grant not the first woman black woman not the first black science fiction writer she was the first science fiction writer to get a macarthur genius grant as far as i know yes i mean she was she most certainly was i don't know if anybody's done it since right well i you know did nk jemison get one i feel like maybe she did did she I think so, but uh, somebody somebody said that yes, I believe so. I think I think you're correct. So and and what you're talking about is so interesting to me. Did you by chance introduce her to Think and Grow Rich? No, no, okay. no, no. she was already into it. Okay, um, she struggled with depression. Yeah, I think that she needed to read her statement about her life aloud so that she some part of her could continue to believe that it was possible. Because when you're putting that much of yourself into your work and you're not getting the response from the world, you can begin to wonder, you know, it, it, are things ever going to change? Am I, am I ever going to be seen? Am I deluding myself by thinking I have something to offer? Um, she struggled with those things, like, like many, many creative artists do. And she was a real artist. I mean, when you think about, you know, classical artists who put everything they have into their work to the point that they're playing with madness, uh, Octavia was there. She was this side of the line of mm -hmm. crazy, no mm -hmm. question about that. But I do think that she put so much of herself into her work that there wasn't there wasn't as much left for the rest of her life as, as certainly I would have liked. Right. Uh, but when, by the time she won the MacArthur Genius Grant, she was a much happier person. I think that she saw the, the, the field changing. She realized that her work was being acknowledged, that her work had meant something to many people. And that kind of, of validation means everything to a writer. So that by the time that she won the MacArthur Genius Grant and moved up to the Seattle area, she was in a place of, of, of relative peace about her life. She, was, she, she laughed a lot more and was a lot happier. I'd like to read, I'm looking at some notebook pages. Octavia Butler scholars will know that her, her papers are at the Huntington Library here in Southern California. Um, and some of her notes to herself have become quite famous on the internet, you know, so be it, see to it is something that's almost a meme at this point. But she has one, she, she says, tell stories filled with facts, make people touch and taste and know, make people feel, 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 all caps, exclamation points. And then here she is laying out her path, which by the way, goal setting is very important for artists, really for everyone, but particularly for artists. So if you're also an artist, pay attention to how Octavia charted her own path. I shall be a best-selling writer, period. Yep, that, that was the one. Go ahead, go ahead, read it. After Imago, each of my books will be on the bestseller list of the LA Times, New York Times, Publishers Weekly, Washington Post, et cetera. She finally got on the New York Times list with Parable of the Sower in 2020 or 2021, long after she passed. But she got there. Okay, she got there. Yes, my novels did. will go 
onto the above list, whether publishers press them hard or not. And, you know, this is speaking to the lack of marketing and publicity. So that suggests that she was frustrated by the yes. lack of, of attention her work was Very doing. frustrated. Whether I'm paid a high advance or not, whether I ever win another award or not, this is my life, period. I write best-selling novels, period. My novels go onto the best-seller list on or shortly after publication. My novels each travel up to the top of the best-seller list and they reach the top and they stay on top for months at least to each of my novels does this, so be it, see to it. I will find the way to do this, so be it, see to it. My books will be read by millions of people. I will buy a beautiful home in an excellent neighborhood. She did that. Yes. After her MacArthur grant, she was able to move up to that area. That was part of what she did with that money. I will send poor Black youngsters to the Clarion and other writers' workshops that, you know, the Clarion, there is an Octavia Butler scholarship that helps send people to the Clarion Writers' yep. Workshop now. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get tearful ready this. I will help Black youngsters broaden their horizons. I will help poor Black youngsters go to college. I will get the best of health care from my mother and myself. She was very close to her late mother. I will hire a car whenever I want to or need to because she did not drive. <laughs> no, that's actually one of the things that uh, that brought us together is that I would give her rides to the library downtown, to book signings and things like that. It was a real joy, but she no, she did not drive. I will travel whenever and wherever in the world that I choose. My books will be read by millions of people. And again, so be it. See to it. Who I say, I take Octavia Butler visualized the life that she wanted for herself, and she was able to create that life. And before I start getting all teary eyed, um, I'm just going to go to her. Her. Well, I was going to read her biography, but maybe I'll save that and I'll talk about when I met Octavia because it was significantly after you met her, Steve. Yeah. I am a little teary thinking about her. Um, I did not get to have a, a long friendship with her like you did, in part because I only met her in 1997, in part, quite frankly, uh, because of my own shyness. I was very, very shy in her presence. I was very she shy. Was imposing. She was. And, 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 you know, we're only going to play excerpts from this interview in 2000, but I mostly remember just sitting there in awe, <laughs> watching two old friends talk. And it was so nice to hear Octavia laugh. You'll hear her laugh on the tape because, because her work can be so grim. Uh, it's easy to forget that she was also, she had a girlish side. I think as a matter of fact, Steve, that you helped bring that out in her. Uh, you know, Octavia did not let her guard down very much, mm -hmm. but she had been a guest in my home. She'd met my wife and my daughter. And I would be very, because I was not in awe of her. I simply knew she was, she was better than me and, but she was my friend. And so I would play with her. I would, I would act, I would try to, 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 to poke at that reserve, try to bring that out because she was simply delightful. She was also just drop dead brilliant. And I would say that you succeeded in bringing it out with her. Oh, I, uh, the the I, full I recording, I just it just really does feel that you brought joy to her life. Um, and now um, for me, I had just published my first novel in 1995. It's called The Between. It was just reissued this year, plug, plug. And um, I was invited to a conference at Clark Atlanta University called the African American Fantastic Imagination Explorations in Science Fiction, Fantasy and Horror. I believe it might have been the first conference of its type in terms of specifically being an Afro, it didn't call itself Afrofuturism. The term existed, but none of us were using it that I know of. <laughs> uh, I, if, if there was a, such a conference, it's possible that Octavia and Chip had been invited to something together, but in terms of the kinds of kind of gathering that that event was, no, I do I do believe you're correct. I do think it was the first. So imagine I'm a new writer, just lucky to be published. As far as I was concerned, uh, the letter got to me months late because they sent it to my publisher, and and honestly, it's just a fluke that I ever received it. Uh, but when I did receive it, I had not missed the conference. I was so excited. I saw Octavia's name. Uh, I saw Stephen Barnes's name, which I recognized. I recognized Steve's name because a friend had already been trying to set me up with Steve across the miles, kind of like you're black, he's black, you write horror, he writes science fiction. And I'd watched an episode of The Outer Limits that Steve had written. So 
it was like, whoa, it was really uh, felt like kismet because I had just heard of Steve. I was actually more excited, Steve, about your name, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and Samuel R. Delaney, who was, uh, was Octavia's mentor, her, her first instructor at Clarion. Harlan Ellison actually, I believe, paid for Octavia to go to yes. Clarion to study under Chip Delaney. So I, I could feel that there was uh, a sense of legacy with and Jewel Gomez, who wrote The Guild of Stories, a queer vampire novel, was also there. So I was just, again, just so happy to be invited, so wide-eyed and so glad to be there. And I got to meet all of these titans in one gathering, fell head over heels for this dude, Steve, uh, like by the weekend. We were like the end of the weekend, we were madly in love with each other. But Octavia was kind of watching it happen. You know, I understand that she and, and Chip Delaney were sort of giggling about watching us spark off of each other. Yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, we'll have to try to get Chip on the show. And oh, we absolutely it. will. We absolutely yeah, I, I will would, get him would, on the I show. I would love to have that conversation. With oh, my goodness, the stories he can tell, you know, because oh. he was a, talk about a pioneer. He, out was, there. The, he was the pioneer. He was oh. the first who actually was trying to make a career in uh, in science fiction. I mean, and... Uh, Writing award-winning stories oh God, out I mean, the gate. Unbelievably brilliant. He Like had, a child, he, basically... He just in order to get into the field and be there because the field did not want him no and no. uh there was there were a lot of things but we don't need to go into that right now we will talk but about what that like to talk about in terms of octavia well i think i'll just read her bio and then we can set up the uh the, the advice and the clips and the stories yeah, that so she we can said the during the interview thing. octavia e butler the e stands for estelle which was actually okay. the name her friends know knew and family knew her by estelle um, born June 22nd, 1947 in Pasadena, California. She died on February 24th, 2006 in Seattle, Washington. She was an African-American author, chiefly noted for her science fiction novels about future societies and superhuman powers, noteworthy for their unique synthesis of science fiction, mysticism, mythology, and African-American spiritualism. And I will add uh, that she had strong women, Black women, protagonists who were in leadership positions and novel after novel after novel. She was educated at Pasadena City College, California State University, and UCLA. Hello, I teach at UCLA. Encouraged by Harlan Ellison, she began her writing career in 1970. The first of her novels, Pattern Master, 1976, was the beginning of her five-volume Patternist series about an elite group of mentally linked telepaths ruled by Doro, a 4,000-year-old immortal African. And that's how I heard about Octavia, because I was in the middle of writing My Soul to Keep, which is my novel about an immortal African. And my friend Robert Vermosi, who's also a writer and knew Octavia's work way better than I did, said, have you read <laughs> the uh, African immortal novel by Octavia Butler? And I was like, <gasps> I was so shocked. I didn't know such a thing existed. So I uh, ran right out and got it. And luckily, uh, they're nothing alike, you know. But um, so she's Wild Seed, Mind of My Mind, Clay's Ark, Parable Series, Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, Kindred, about a woman who's yanked back into the antebellum slavery period. If you do not know Octavia Butler's work, absolutely do go pick something up. Often Kindred is a first choice for some people or Parable of the Sower is a good first choice as a reader. So as I mentioned at the top, we were assigned by American Visions Magazine to visit Octavia Butler at her newish home at that time in Seattle. I think we were all in town for a science fiction conference of some kind while she was alive. Steve, Octavia, writers like Nalo Hopkinson and I were invited to a series of conferences that would call themselves Black to the Future, <laughs> if you remember this, Steve. Um, so in any case, we were, we were in town, I think for a conference and we walked up the walkway and I could hear the Motown. It, I, I, in my memory, it's Motown. I don't know if it really was, but just blasting from inside the house. So it sounded like there was a party going on in there and, and she didn't even hear us knocking on the door at first, I don't think. And then she explained that she likes to listen to music while she writes. And I also like to listen to music while I write. So it was a great day already for me. And we chatted with her for a little more than an hour. We have picked the excerpts from that conversation 
that are the kinds of questions we would have asked her if she were actually a guest on the podcast today, you know, that have to do with writing and the writing process and advice for writers. So this first clip is about the importance of perseverance as a writer. And this is what Octavia had to say. Students in the sense of um, coming prepared to actually become a writer. Um, she could barely put a sentence together. Yeah. She was truly an awful writer. And she came to me sometime during the, um, my week and said, do you think I could ever be a writer? And I thought about Harlan and all the terrible things he said to people, sometimes to good advantage. I mean, you know. You can be dissuaded. Let yeah, yourself be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anything can stop you from being yeah. a writer, don't be one, right. Yeah. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, um, you know, you probably can, but you know as well as I do that you're going to have to work a lot harder at it than most of the other people in the class and it's gonna take time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really keep in touch with her. I just ran into her every now and then. She lived in the Midwest someplace. And the last time I ran into her was at a book fair done in San Francisco and she showed me her first book. Yes! How oh, wonderful! <laughs> Isn't that neat? Perseverance. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's yep. a great story. It's just a matter of, do you want it? Do yes. you want it badly okay. enough? Yeah, badly. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now that, that strikes me as being so true. We all know people who just sort of seem like they're sprinting right out of the blocks who have natural talent, ability, and oh, I've got the right a environment. I've known a couple of those, too, you know, and they, they fizzled. Rather yes, rather. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the most brilliant people I mm -hmm. ever knew, once they got exposed to the real world, once they stopped being the stars, they could not stand the shadows. They, they mm -hmm. couldn't handle it. And everybody I know who has just plugged steadily along has gotten mm -hmm. there. Every single plugger has mm -hmm. gotten there. Right. First of I, all, the tape sounds a little weird. <laughs> Doesn't quite sound well, like it. It's actually actually sounds the sound quality is is, is good. I, I like good. it. Good. And and all of that. Uh, what it, first of all, I love that illustration. I think the beginning might have been cut off a little bit. She was talking about a student that she had at Clarion, mm -hmm. who was not at the skill level of the other students. And Yes, and I know, Steve, this is something you believe in very strongly, the idea of work over talent and how important it is. I mean, no matter how naturally, quote unquote, talented you are, it really doesn't mean anything if you're not able or willing to put in the work. You know, I think that for all practical purposes, talent is an unuseful concept. The only time I've ever seen talent brought up by somebody it's in connection with them feeling like they didn't have it and therefore didn't try. Um, I've never heard somebody say, I've got the talent and therefore I'm going to go through any barrier that anybody ever offers me. I will person. No, I've never heard that. I mean, it, <laughs> the, it, it, it's the, you know, I believe that I can turn myself into what I need to be to, to meet my dreams. You know, people who read books like Think and Grow Rich, We'll see that uh, Napoleon Hill, who uh, was wrote the first major self-improvement book in some ways, believed in clear goals, daily hard work, visualizing your outcome, finding mentors who can advise you and support you, being willing to humble yourself to 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 begin. You know, he all the things that I believe in. That was that was the book that that really started my lifelong obsession with that. And none of that has to do with innate talent. I think that there is innate interest. I mean, if there is a talent, if there is one talent that I would want someone to have more than anything else, it would be the capacity to focus your mind and energy on a goal until you've accomplished it. Regardless okay. of the uh, slings and arrows and That's regardless right. of, of the voices in your head. And, That's the quality. And yeah. you give me that. And then you give me someone who's willing to learn and constantly, I mean, constantly improving the quality of the work. We were just talking about this today, that you have to both do and study. You have to, you have to actually look, be able to take apart your skill into its component pieces and then look at those component pieces and ask what do i need 
where maybe have I done something else in my life that needs a, that has a similar skill so I can transfer? I mean, there a lot of times, you know, somebody would walk into a martial arts school, you know, our martial arts school, and they were like black belts the minute they walked in. But when you found out more about them, you found out that they had been combat veterans or they had boxed or they grew up in an abusive household where they'd learned how to fight in a bad neighborhood where they'd learned how to fight, that they already had those things. They were athletes and other skills. We all have, if you take a look at the, at what it takes to be a writer, can you public speak? Can you express yourself in words? Can you remember your dreams? Have you, you know, a voracious appetite for reading? Reading, yes, reading. You have um, a, a resistance to disappointment. There are so many things that, that, that go into being a writer that if you could find some of those skills developed in yourself that you might have developed in another arena, you can take them into writing and use them to kind of create a foundation. And, and you know, I'm going to keep doing this until I can feel proud of my work. You know, the, the whole life writing premium program that we, that we have is based on the notion of incremental learning over time, um, starting with small pieces like committing to doing the work, committing to doing the research, being aware of that it's going to take some time to get you there. Um, so Octavia was one of the people whose advice informed that six-step process, that core six-step process that we use. And it's brutal. You know, you, you, you can tell by the, the house there that she lived in a, in a fairly humble situation. This is a duplex in this. It's, product, a, it's, a, right? it's a duplex. That's right. Yeah. Um, and the neighborhood was not good. The neighborhood is better now than it was when she was living there. She was scared. I mean, she's a big, big woman. Uh, and she, she asked you, yeah, she was six feet tall from the time she was in middle school. And didn't yeah. she ask you at one point for advice on like a self-defense class? Yeah, she, she did. And unfortunately, I didn't have the understanding at that time that would be able to help her because the, the styles of karate that I'd studied at that period of time were demanded athleticism mm -hmm. and she was not athletic uh i would have now you know i would have had much better advice to give her a few years later of course the, sub the subject wasn't wasn't there anymore but yeah to she so she dealt with with fear of just walking to her door and she worked at, at jobs to support herself as a writer you know the secretarial jobs and filing i think filing not secretarial she would do you know did filing and she just she did everything she could because on some level she believed in herself. She believed that there was some spark inside her that if she could just fan it properly and develop the, the, the grit to just keep going and keep going, that eventually she'd find some gold in there if she just kept digging. And yes. Well, her, she, 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 made, she did it. She certainly did. And as you were listing, you know, all, the, all of those elements that are more important than talent, <laughs> I was saying to myself, check, check, check. Octavia did all of those things. And you're absolutely right. That does inform our understanding of how to succeed as, as writers, too. So, so the next excerpt has to do with how, as a writer, you choose what to write about. <laughs> You know, this is the thing that that sometimes bedevils uh, artists. They they have the drive, they want to persevere, but they're not quite sure what to write about. So that's what this next clip from Octavia will address. To what degree have you consciously mined your own past and your own experience for thematic constantly story material? And I mean that I think most writers would consider that to be a core aspect of, of creativity and creative mm -hmm. honesty. Um, when students ask you about that, do you have, you, you've taught off enough that you might even have a standard reply to them concerning the use of your own experience in your writing. What, what do you say? Um, well, sort of the opposite, really. Um, so many students are told, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, write what you care about. Mm. Write what makes you feel passionate. Mm -hmm. You know, write what really just won't let you alone. Mm -hmm. And do your research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're very well known. You've spoken often about how much time you spend researching. You'll you'll travel to the ends of the earth. Well, <laughs> the uh, mountains of Chile, wasn't it? No, Peru. Peru, mountains mm -hmm. of Peru. 
to research. Um, don't get me wrong. I was having a great time. <laughs> good, good. And you actually you went up to Amazon once, didn't mm -hmm. you? Because I remember you were getting ready to do it, but I forgot whether or not I asked specifically asked same you that. Trip. Done. Okay, mm -hmm. same trip. Yeah. Can you describe the role of research in the overall cycle of your writing process, if you would, or mm -hmm. if, you, if you would just discuss what the overall cycle is between between initial inspiration and finished product? What are the different steps that you go through? Oh shoot. Oh, garbage, garbage, garbage. <laughs> she spilled something on herself. You're the stain. Yep. Oh, I shouldn't have put on my shirt before, um... You well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, um... Because it's not that noticeable, really, but... I'd like to know something about the overall cycle of your work between initial inspiration on a project and the final draft, sending it into the editor. You know, research mm -hmm. is in there, inspiration is in there, work is in there, but just what... How would you describe that cycle? Well, for one thing, it doesn't go to the editor unless uh, until I feel that it's really ready for publication. Mm -hmm. And um, that's always been the way I work. But, um, goodness, it's not always the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have one method that works for all my novels. Mm -hmm. you know? For instance, um, my early my early writing... The whole process was um, was different just because these were stories that I had, as I tell people, in the trunk. Right. Yeah. And I think we all begin that way. We have these stories that we've been carrying around for years and years. In my case, I've been carrying Pattern Master around since I was 12. Wow. Wow. And Mind of My Mind since I was 15. Mm -hmm. Survivor since 19 and Kindred since college. Right. And... These were all things that I wanted to write, and I, I, I had incomplete ideas. And I, I, what I kept doing in, in the first um, three cases was writing novels that never ended. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really know how to write a novel. I didn't know, for instance, that in my case, I really do need to know the end before I begin. Otherwise, it'll just go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just sort of kind of wander off into the ether. And, <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, I, after I finished The Trunk, and that wouldn't just be those novels, but for instance, um, Clay's Ark would have been part of it just because I had always said I wanted to do a novel on how the clay arcs came to be. Mm -hmm. um, um, Wild Seed would have been part of it, although Wild Seed was more on, in the line of uh, giving myself a reward for having finished Kindred. Oh, yeah. Yes. Kindred was a, a long, depressing ride. And because Wild of what Seed, the woman was going through? Mm -hmm, because I, I really had to do enough research so that I, I had to understand it on a level that I didn't really want to understand. Yes. Exactly. You know? Was there any specifically most disturbing thing that you came to realize about the institution of slavery yeah, that you had not understood before? It's um yeah, well, it's not that I hadn't understood it. Because in a way the reason I wrote this novel was because I did understand something of it. It's just that there's a difference between understanding it and feeling it. Yes. And that was what I was I was going for the feeling. So mm -hmm. which which aspect of slavery specifically um, struck it's, it's you most something deeply? that something that um, is is um, best expressed by um, a quotation that I came upon much later okay. um, from Steve Biko. Okay. Um, it's something like this. The most effective weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Yes. Mm. Yes. And, uh, I mean, that's not totally accurate, but it's very close to what he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in slavery, well, I mean, that's, it, that's the root of a lot of our problems now. Yes. People don't realize how much they have internalized. And it's still there. Okay. Wow. That was a big meaty clip. Yeah, it was. Where do you want to start? Well, there's a lot of unpacking in there. Uh, <laughs> but I, I love how she turns that old adage on its head instead of just write what you know to write what you care about, because right. that really encapsulates who Octavia was as a writer. She was passionately trying to convince us to change our path as humanity, passionately, every book, every every story, 
was a plea from her to be better, to do better, to aspire for more. Well, that was kind of perfectly stated right there. Uh, I don't want to add anything to that at all. Uh, what's the next thing? <laughs> okay, well, well, in terms really, of that research. Was, that, was, that was graceful and concise and beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you, darling. And then she talks. Like Shaw, well, thank you. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my Octavia Butler t-shirt. I have, yeah. a, if you're watching the video, there's, you can find the YouTube playlist for the Life Writing Podcast on YouTube if you want to see my Octavia t-shirt. She's wearing a space helmet. Um, the other piece that really stuck, stood out to me is the research piece. Because as someone who has also written historical novels, um, research is a big, big part of it. She didn't talk about, you know, the perils of getting lost in your research, which I think is uh, a real problem that some writers fall into. But she did talk about her issues with not knowing how to end a novel, which I will extrapolate out to some form of outlining, right? That she realized she could not just free write her novels. She wasn't a pantser in that sense. No, she, she outlined and researched encyclopedically. Yes. Um, I think that I might touch back on that first comment, the thing sure. about not writing what you know, but writing what you love. The beautiful thing about that comment is that in general, the things that we're really good at are things that we love uh, because we spend a lot of time doing them, that it is easy to motivate ourselves to spend that time as opposed to trying to force yourself to get good at something because you think that some down, down the road somewhere someone's going to buy it. Right. You know, if you work on and write things that you love, then you're going to automatically spend that time and you're going to get better and you're automatically going to be writing things, I think, that have a greater chance to have an internal integrity. This is said from passion, not because it's a product, but because you needed to express yourself. You know, in, uh, in, I think it was Gene Kelly, maybe, or, or one of those people like that, who said that in a musical, when uh, the emotions get so, so great that you cannot talk anymore, you sing. And when they grow even greater, you dance. So the question was always bringing the emotions up to the action. But that suggests something, to the degree that that is true, it suggests something about all of our work, that that what motivates us to dance or to type should be an emotion so powerful that we can't express it just with ordinary communication. There's something deep, there's something strong, there's something that is inside you that is just dying to get out. Um, and Octavia, the thing that I have focused on and, and, and commented on a number of times is that I remember that the thing that she was most frightened about with humanity was the hierarchical nature of human beings and the tendency to place our own tribes higher on that hierarchy. And she looked at that in terms of racism and, and uh, gender uh, discrimination more than anything else. Those two things were probably the Gordian knot that she was trying to cut because she, she saw them as symptomatic of a rot at the core of human consciousness that was going to destroy us. That is actually a great segue. I don't mean to sound so cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> well, good news on that. Yay! No, uh, the reason I sound so cheerful is because that is a great segue to our next excerpt from Octavius interview that day where she directly addressed Hooray, we're gonna die <laughs> <laughs> right where she directly addresses this idea that there might be a little bit of pessimism in her writing oh yeah just and, <laughs> and if you've read octavia you know exactly what i'm talking about so here's octavia discussing her pessimism readers have uh often commented what seems to be a, a bleakness of vision, an underlying threat of pessimism in much of your work. How would you address Blah. that? Blah. Blah. <laughs> oh, Sunshine. goodness. Well, hey, I mean, look at us. Look at us. Look what we keep doing. We keep marching to the brink and then drawing back. And the horrible thing is there are some things you can't draw back. I mean, even now, okay, 
um, the Russian ship goes up to the, the, the Arctic and says, gee, there's, there's no ice here, you know, where we would expect to find ice. Yeah. And I listened to several programs in which people said, well, maybe it's natural. Or, well, this, this happens occasionally, and um, nobody says global warming. You know, except maybe the reporter who's asking questions. Is this global warming? Because that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't think of global warming because there was a, a you know, a, a, at the North Pole there was there was not that much ice. I thought of global warming because of the whole family of, of stuff that's been happening. Right. And it's not a matter of oh, global warming will kill us because it won't, mm -hmm. but it'll kill a lot of people. And it already is killing a lot of people in Africa. Mm. But I mean, we've, we've got so many indicators. And people find them inconvenient. So e they look at each one separately and say, well, you can't prove anything by this. And, and mm. you know, we, we just don't seem to be, well, we're not, we're not really that long term. We're longer term than I guess any other animal species as far as thinking goes. But we're not long term enough for our technology. Hmm. It seems like what our technology is doing um, is, is, is helping us to um, do what every other species does, which is basically turning as much of the Earth into ourselves as we can before we crash. Oof, I got goosebumps. Listen to that. Um, and the passion at the beginning of that excerpt, look at us, look at us. I mean, I'm telling you, she was begging in her work for us to take it seriously, the road to ruin, which part of it was hierarchy, part of it was denial, right? Um, we've seen that with climate change. We saw it with COVID. She would not have been the least bit surprised at COVID denial. I think that she, uh, you know, I've always said that uh, if you're going to go into science fiction, there should be some science that you're prepared to focus on. And Octavia seems to have focused on animal behavior and reproductive behavior, animal physiology. So she, I think that that was a trip to the Amazon, had to do with observing certain animals in, in the wild. I think she was looking to understand human beings by looking at our animal predecessors, looking at the behavior of animals and assuming that it was on a continuum with human behavior. You know, are animals self-destructive? in this way are um do animals hurt each other the way human beings do where does this come from that was something she was passionately concerned about yeah she was and and i love that excerpt precisely because you can hear so much passion i mean first she well two things i love she starts laughing when and she does the uh impression of miss piggy moi <laughs> Which, oh, come on, how funny is that? But then she she dives in. She dives deeply into the core, I believe, of what she was just about as a person, as a writer. Just look at us. Look what we're doing. That I mean, that might have well have been the title of every <laughs> Octavia novel. Well, look what we're doing. And I think that she did look at the negatives more than she would spend time looking at what we've done in a positive sense. I think that she wondered how I managed to remain as positive as I am. And so did Harlan, as I recall, he, he ribbed you a lot about sort of a Pollyanna ish in his view, you know, say? This is the only <laughs> life I've got, I'm going to enjoy it as much as I possibly can, you know, but I think that, uh, that people who think that I, have a uh, an overly optimistic view of humanity are ignoring the you know 50 years of martial arts training <laughs> 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 like, you know, do you really you know doesn't don't you understand that maybe there's some connection there yeah he's been studying martial arts since he was two so that's <laughs> You do the math anyway uh, yeah. <laughs> well there, there's a secret I rarely tell anybody. I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you have to, you know, of course, our emotions are created partially by what we choose to focus on. 
Octavia focused on the problems regarding race and gender in America. As a result, she did, did deep dives into that material. And, you know, unlike, say, Spike Lee, whose Do the Right Thing was about racism and people would ask him, well, what's the answer? And he'd say, man, I don't know the answer. I barely phrased the question. That Octavia would create dramatic scenarios in which people were dealing with extremes of these problems and then show some of the answers, some potential answers. You know, the, and the fact that religions entered into her work, the creation of religions or spiritual forms. Especially um, Earthseed in, in Parable of the Sower, her, her yeah. dad. The only lasting truth is change. Yes, which is extraordinarily Taoist. I mean, it's very I Ching. Um, she's coming, but I think that you, you study nature and the cycles of nature, and I think that she was looking there for, well, it looks like winter, but, you know, after the winter comes the spring. You know, that, that we, you know, look at us, we keep go, tiptoeing up to the edge and then coming back. I think that she was starting to see or I don't want to say this, you know, with any kind of sense of self-congratulation. So I'll just say that I think that she was starting to develop a philosophy that suggested that, that life moved in cycles and that the, the horrors that we see sometimes at certain points in those cycles, when people feel pushed beyond a certain point, were not signs that human beings could not survive, nor were they aberrations, but it's part of the process. You know, you can expect these things to happen just as you can expect birth and renewal. Um, you know, to me, you know, I don't know, I can't claim that that is accurate in terms of where she was coming from, but there were enough comments and thoughts that suggested that she was coming to a sense of peace about it. And I think that, that one of the wisest things you can do if you're a really intelligent person is recognize that there are limits to your intelligence, mm -hmm. limits to to how far you can see and how, how much data you can crunch. Um, and if she studied history, which she did, and she studied nature, which she did, and she believed that human beings were on a continuum with nature, which she did, then the possibility that we're just a part of nature comes in there and that yes it is absolutely possible that we might dig ourselves into a hole we can't climb out of but it is also possible that it just seems that way to those of us you know every generation sees the nightmare that things might be and the next generation builds on that and solves the problems and so far you know for the 250 million uh, thousand years or whatever of, of human history we have made it will we continue to that's another really good question she... But I think she was starting to have more faith i think that, that would be that would be good um if the only lasting truth is change then that implies that the cycles of life are are embedded in the matrix in, and in she the, understood that is. yes that's yes right. So this next clip um, is a little sad because it, it it's about writer's block. And, and again, it perfectly fits as if she's a guest here on our Life Writing Podcast because these are the kinds of things that we talk about. N.K. Jemison, an earlier guest, was very candid about her struggles with writer's block in a, in a previous podcast, if you missed that. And we do encourage all of our, our guests to just really lay their hearts bare so that you, as artists who are striving to be where they are can see, first of all, they're only human. And second of all, that you can overcome these feelings and these cycles where you don't feel creative and, and where you struggle. Um, Octavia somewhat famously did suffer from writer's block for part of her life. One sad thing from this interview is that she spoke at length about a manuscript that she actually never wrote. Uh, she won the MacArthur grant. She wanted to write a story about a woman who got a gift. She was trying to process the enormity of this gift she had been given. And she talked a little bit about it. I, I, I've never heard another word about that one. She never finished the third book in her parable series, which was going to be called Parable of the Trickster. But 
I will say though, that by the time she passed away, I think she had turned a corner because fledgling came out shortly before she died and she was writing again. And as a, as a writer, it's okay sometimes if a novel isn't working, you know, it's okay. But, but she, I think she suffered from that a little bit more than most. And in this clip, she talks about the difficulty of, uh, of writing. Stephen King refers to his creative process as the boys in the basement. Uh, how, how would you characterize yours? Oh, I don't have anything like that, my goodness. <laughs> no, just me and my subconscious, you know. But no voices, no uh, well, conversations all, under all the trees. voices, but, but it, it's, it's, I had to make that okay, because mm. when I was little, it scared the hell out of me. So, so hear people talking. your ideas tend to come to you in terms of voices, as opposed yeah, to images? Yeah, they, they, are, they are specifically voices. Okay, so, so you hear words talking mm -hmm. about, you know, this mm -hmm. idea, that idea, mm -hmm. and then will you you begin a research process after that. Will will ideas cook in your head for years? It seems that you well, they plot. have. Well, especially as a young writer, I think, like I said, you know, the talk novels. Yeah, exactly. But like now, when I got the idea for Parable of the the um, Trickster, I thought I had it, and I thought I had it, and I thought I had it, and I didn't have it. Did you have a sense of where the story would end? Yes, as a matter of fact, wow. I had a very clear ending for it. And you worked on it for two years. Mm hmm And it's like, not working. It died many times. Mm. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, I remember talking to you when you were finishing up Parable of the Talents. Mm -hmm. And even that, it felt oh, like I, I went tear through it. Yeah, 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 I went through it with that, too. So is writing getting more difficult? Yes, actually. When people used to say that when I was a kid, I would say, how is that possible? Mm. You know, how can you learn your craft and then it becomes more difficult? But it's true because wow. your trunk is empty and you have to, you know, keep filling it. Mm. That's a scary thought. You think that, you're going, <laughs> that your work is going deeper than it used to? No, I just think that I have to keep finding places for it to go. Okay. Mm. So before, the first few novels that you wrote, you wrote, in, in essence, they've been cooking for 19 or 20 or 25 years. Now they only have a couple years mm -hmm. to cook, and so mm -hmm. you, you need to, you know, create that, a microwave. That's why, that's why they need that, that much time. I mean, I used to turn out a novel in a year mm -hmm. with no problem. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, my, my first group of novels, I turned out uh, two and a half novels in a year. Wow. And um, it's interesting what desperation will do. And, and it, once you've done it, then you know you can do it, right. you mm -hmm. know. And then, mm -hmm. wow, Zoom. Yes. Well, now, on average, I don't know how long you, you worked on Parable of the Talents. How, how long is it taking you on average oh, to write a novel these days? Five years. Five years? But luckily, that, is, that is embarrassing. No, me. but your oh, readers yeah. are willing to wait. <laughs> oh, I'm not willing to wait. Right. <laughs> because it's not a matter of steady progress. Mm. It's the only reason that I guess I, I, I can deal with it is because it's a lot like the way I used to write papers when I was in school. Mm -hmm. Um... I had to learn a couple of things. First, I'm a bit dyslexic, mm -hmm. and I would, when I was in elementary school, and we were told, write this, 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 and this, I was always the one who didn't finish and had to stay after school and finish, you know, because mm -hmm. they wrote very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but I went on writing slowly as, as I got older, and... and okay. Oh, 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 oh I was going to say what? Um, we were talking about writing slowly. Yeah, yeah, writing yeah, writer. Uh, yeah, um... One of the things I had to learn was to tell in a very few words what everybody else took pages and pages to tell. Yeah. And the, right. other, the other thing I had to learn was how my mind worked. Mm -hmm. um, when we were given an assignment, you know, write a paper about this or that, you know how it, is. it was in school. I don't know how it is now, but how it was. I would sit there and worry about it until maybe half the time was gone. And, I mean, I would get almost nothing done. I would sit there and, 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 and scribble death on the paper or something, you know. <laughs> kill, kill, kill. <laughs> and um, finally, finally, you know, when it looked like I wasn't going to make it, you know, then I would, I would, it would click into place and I would start writing furiously. Right. You know. But knowing that about myself has helped me with these novels, because it still doesn't take more than a year to write a novel. Sure. It's just that it takes a long time to get to the point of being able to write the novel. Right. Whew. I felt that in my spirit. 
takes about a year to write a novel. I think that that's on average true. Right. Well, I can, you know, I can relate now because during the time we did that interview, I was trying to get on that book a year schedule. You know, I would take a year, I maybe two years to write my soul to keep. I was more like two years to write a novel, but man, this last one, the reformatory took seven years. So I can have you beat there, Octavia. You said you took five <laughs> on Parable of Talent. Yeah, but she was right. She wasn't writing and you have been writing. Octavia was righteously blocked. You've never been blocked. That's true. I was just writing other things that were more fun because like she said of Kindred, I found the world of that novel just terribly difficult to insert myself into on a regular basis. It was, you know, but um, yeah, that I, I love the way she shared that with us. And I haven't heard that clip in a very long time. So now I'm relearning. What quite. is it about the clip that hits you so hard? Well, because she goes back to childhood. She goes back to being in school and she talks about her disability, her dyslexia, and how she had to wire around it to access her writer part. Uh, I don't know that I would have been a writer if I were dyslexic. I don't know. You know, I don't know if I would have fought and struggled as hard as she did. You know, I'm going to make a make a comment. You have said about other things. You don't know if you would have been a writer if you'd had this obstacle or that obstacle that this or that person had or obstacles that I've had. I think that real artists or a real anything, if that's what you are, you're going to find a way to make it happen. You know, mm -hmm. other other dyslexic people have become art, have become writers. Um, you know, it is it is not it's not impossible. What happens is, is there a part of you that feels like you if you can't do this, you're going to die. If you can't do this, you're not going to feel alive. You're, you're not going to feel complete in life. I think that if you have that, you know, the, the, we know that you know, neurologically, we know that the brain has a tremendous amount of what's called neuroplasticity, the ability to wire around damage. And I think that our personalities are much the same way. We can have phobias, flaws, we can be dealing with abuse issues. But there's something about the human spirit that won't be denied. Um, and if you really care, if you can admit that you care, that you're prepared to throw yourself into it, that you're prepared to burn your bridges behind you, I'm going to bet on that person. I wouldn't bet against them. They'll find a way. You know, life finds a way like dinosaurs, you know, figuring out how to how to produce male and female when it's supposed to be all female dinosaurs. In Jurassic Park, you're going to find a way. I, I believe in us. I believe in human beings. So Octavia's success in that sense was a function of her will and her focus over time and her willingness to honestly tap into what concerned her, what scared her, what inspired her, and what she loved. I, I, I don't think that little obstacles like dyslexia stop a person like that well no and i appreciate you correcting me there honey because when you ask do i feel most alive when i write or like i would die if i don't write i mean the answer is yes writing gets me through times when i'm not feeling well like during the pandemic if if i had like sort of a minor illness it was panic time because i was so worried about covid i could disappear into my writing my first black lives matter moment in 1980 and Arthur McDuffie, when the police officers who beat him to death were all acquitted. And I was like, oh my God, what? <laughs> I, I was so in disbelief. Liberty and justice for all, I thought, what? <laughs> and, and that, my writing rescued me from that. So I will correct it to say, I probably would still be writing if, if my parents had discouraged me, which is a belief I've said, if they discouraged yeah. me, I might not be a writer. I probably would be a writer if I'd had a disability like uh, dyslexia. But uh, what I'm speaking to is that, thankfully, writing is so much fun for me. And, and what comes through, in, at least in that excerpt to me, is that it was not always fun for Octavia. And I don't know what percentage of the time it was fun. I know that there are some writers who never feel like they're having fun, but they feel like they have to do it. And I'm just blessed that I, I don't think I'm one of those writers. I really love the process of writing disappearing into a story is my happy place it really is um 
and you take so much pleasure once you're there. I've seen you in situations where there was a lot of external stress, but if you could disappear in a story world, you know, there'd be times when I would go and look at you in the office because I wanted to talk to you or I wanted to hang out with you. And I realized that it was better just to let you play. It was better just to let you stay there that it wouldn't be a kindness to pull you out of your happy place in in that sense. I didn't. I never took it personally. I don't think I ever have, um, because you you're the real deal. You you love that and your your component skills. Although you can break down structure, you function greatest in just that flow state where you just disappear into the danger zone where the dancer becomes the dance. Disappear and 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 it's all the more to Octavia Butler's credit that between her visualizations and her written goals early in her career, when she wasn't getting the attention that her writing deserved and she knew it, <laughs> okay, um, all the way through her her battling depression uh, and and battling writer's block that she still persevered and left us this tremendous gift of her bibliography. Yeah, it's quite a body of work. It is quite a body of work. Um, you were so blessed to have the relationship and friendship with her that you did, all those dinners. I'm to be honest, I give thanks for it every day. When I do my morning ritual, where I give thanks for things in my life, one of the, you know, one of the maybe 10 people who I thank by name in my ritual is Octavia Butler. Beautiful. Um, I have, you know, I, I'm, I hope, I'm, I'm glad, I, I'm glad that you think that I made her happy, that I, I, I gave her smiles. You heard her laughing. That wasn't because of me. She barely knew me. <laughs> but yeah, but she really enjoyed the two of us. She yeah. Felt like we were family. Yeah. <laughs> and if she was living alone, she was happy that I was not. Right. Well, she was in some ways married to her craft, I would yes, say. She really was. Yeah. So talk, I mean, talk about life writing, right? Yes. When, when your life is your writing uh, and that great gift she left behind. And these are the kinds of lessons that, that Steve and I talk about in our life writing premium course, everything from craft to the writer's life. Yeah, maintenance of, of the emotional set that you need in order to keep going against discouragement. You know, there's tactics and strategy, not just for how to write, the structure of writing, but how to be a writer, how to plan your career, how to do the market research that you need, and how to develop the mindset that will enable you to keep going long enough to see the fruits of your labors. Um, all of these things, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, all it really is is a message in a bottle that I wish I could send back to my own 15-year-old self, my own 20-year-old self. It's like, this is the stuff you should know. This will right. get you there faster. Um, and you know, to the degree that, that I, you know, we're constantly trying to find ways to make it better. How can we make it better? Uh, how can we give people more? You know, the, the program, which is at lifewritingpremium.com, uh, we just last Sunday did a life writing hot seat where we would have our students submit stories and then we criticize those stories using a very specific method using the hero's journey gently gently critique gently. i would say yeah gently gently critique uh lightly killed is my <laughs> no <laughs> not at all <laughs> um and um we how does one become an Octavia Butler? Well, if you have the heart to be an Octavia Butler, and then you have, you know, you're willing to submit yourself to classes like Clarion and teachers like, like Chip Delaney, I can't substitute for that live interaction. But we do honestly believe that the Life Writing Premium course is the best writing course on the market. And it's, you know, we, we genuinely love writers and we genuinely love writing. So we strongly recommend that, you know, give it a shot, you know, go to lifewritingpremium.com uh, and give it a shot. And, you know, also, if you have thoughts and comments about our podcast, what is the URL for leaving a message? 
Well, go to our uh, website, which is really just lifewritingpodcast.com, and you'll see a way you can leave us a voicemail. So if you enjoyed this program today, if you didn't even know that you could hear Octavia Butler giving you writing advice and you have something you'd like to say about that, go to lifewritingpodcast.com, leave us a voicemail, and we might play it next time. Yeah. And, you know, please let people know about this and leave us comments, reviews, requests so that we can make this even better. Every week, we would just want to make this better and better and better and serve you more and more. So thank you so, so, so much for joining us on the podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to the wisdom of Octavia E. Butler herself as much as we have. And I, I just feel so full and I'll be thinking about her all night now. And, and hopefully you can remember her words as inspiration as you write yourself as the hero or heroine in your own story. In the adventure of your lifetime, which is the greatest story ever told. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.